Forget about the stories you've read in history books. Our food customs are our most direct connection to the world of the past. This is history that you can touch, smell, and above all, taste. It's longer. The rituals of breakfast, lunch, and dinner are something I think we take for granted, as if they have always existed as they are now. I think I'd have preferred it fried. You'd have a heart attack by lunchtime. But unpick the stories of our three main meals, and you discover gastronomic revolutions, technological leaps, and sometimes gruesome realities. Decay is also going to cause really bad breath. Yes, I think I've had boyfriends like that. I never miss a good meal, but food is about more than just filling up. There's a rich and complex history to our daily meal times, and that's what I'm setting out to explore. Right, dig in. Of all our daily meals, the first of the day has the most mysterious history. The origins of some of the best-loved breakfast ingredients that I'm going in search of are buried deep in our collective past. But I want to start with what we think of now as a traditional breakfast, and so I've come to the kind of establishment where it still takes pride of place: the British calf. In this case, a biker's calf. The so-called English breakfast, or full English, is our best-known contribution to international cuisine. This is, I suspect, what most of us think of as the quintessential morning meal. But there's something unexpected going on here because this isn't the start of the working day; it's the end of the week. So Friday night in a biker's cafe, what could be nicer? And you're having a full English. You can't beat a full English. It's after a long ride. It's not only a meal that you can eat in the morning. You know, you can eat it pretty much at any point during the day. And yeah, you know, I don't believe that they say it's unhealthy for you. I don't believe that either. But do you ever have it for breakfast? Most weekends we have a fry up of some kind. Do you like a full English yourself? I have been known to have one or twelve. Yes. In fact, <laughs>、um, I once got accused by my wife. I'm not sure on a diet at the moment, but、uh, I was accused of living on them at one point. Can't think of anything better by yourself. Me neither. The full English has become so iconic, in fact, that it's now a dish to be enjoyed at any time of day or night. For sure, we, we'll witness strange mixtures at this time of the day, where people are ordering a breakfast with a. Glass of Stella. Personally, I prefer to eat mine in the morning, and nowadays without the pint of lager. The phrase "bacon and eggs" is so familiar to us now, you might never have wondered how or why they were first put together on a plate. But it's a story intricately bound up with the customs and rhythms of life in a much earlier age. Back in the day when our morning meal first got its name. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church determined what you could eat and when. One of the most important rules was that no one should eat until after morning mass. Only then could you break your fast. We also have the clergy to thank for creating the combination of bacon and eggs, although it came about almost by accident. Because for roughly half the days of the year, the church forbade people to eat meat at all. On the days when you couldn't eat meat, you would have to face something like this. Yeah, what's this? Well, this is salt fish 
um, which has been prepared in a manner that would have been common in the Middle Ages. So it's salt fish which has been soaked and served here with uh, mustard and honey. Do you think that grace would improve the smell? Um, probably not, but um, <laughs> it might be a good thing to do. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Father Tim Gardner is a member of the Dominican Order, which was founded in the 13th century, and he is something of an expert on medieval religious strictures. Actually, it's better than it looks. It's hmm? a lot better lot than better. it looks. Was the belief that a Piscarian diet was in somehow more virtuous? There certainly was an idea that certain kinds of food had physical effects. And, you know, we know that's true nowadays. I mean, it's not such a strange idea. You know, chocolate, double cream, they make you feel happy. Um, that's the serotonin. Absolutely. So meat, well, meat is flesh. Mm -hmm. um, there was an idea around that because meat uh, is the product of sexual reproduction, there was a, a clear connection between meat in particular and sex. So, you know, you eat meat, you're going to be thinking about sex, which is not what you want well, monks if, and friars to be thinking about. Not if you take the vow of celibacy. Absolutely. No, that is fascinating. I never actually thought of, you know, the, the constrictions on, on meat eating as being because meat was the product of obvious reproduction. One of the reasons. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's, that's a new one to me. Nuns and monks had to observe the rules more strictly than most, but they applied to everyone, and the most intense period of abstinence in medieval times was Lent. It became traditional to fill up immediately beforehand on all the things you would not be allowed to eat, which is why we have pancakes. But this is also the point at which bacon and eggs comes into the story. In Lent, it's a time when you can't eat eggs, and that's a significant source of protein. Something else, of course, that you, you can't eat during Lent is meat. So it's not, it's not just the butter and milk and eggs that we use up on Shrove Tuesday, uh, but meat too. So the day before Shrove Tuesday used to be known as Collop Monday. Really? Collop meaning a bit of meat. Yeah. Um, and that was a time when scraps of meat might be used up. Um, so if it was pork, bacon, you'd also have eggs that you were trying to, to use up. So there you have it. Your full English. Bacon and eggs. So that's how it all began, with a single day of indulgence in the medieval calendar just before Lent. But why have bacon with your eggs and not some other kind of meat? To find out more about the origin of our best-known breakfast ingredient, I've come to see an old friend of mine, Jan McCourt. He's a pig farmer. <laughs> so what breeds have we got here? Mainly uh, purebred British lops, which is the rarest of the, of the British rare breeds. And they do us very well. They have good large litters, they're very hardy, and they taste very good. Yes, absolutely do they. My favourite pig. British. And a couple of saddlebacks. Looking at Jan's happy herd, it's not hard to imagine the scene in a medieval village when almost every cottager would have kept pigs. They are wonderfully low maintenance animals, and given enough space, they can be largely left to forage for themselves, which is very much how Jan likes to do things. What is your philosophy of stock rearing? Well, when I approached farming from, from a different life... Um, from banking? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'd always wanted to farm and to take as extensive as opposed to intensive an approach as possible. And so rear pigs, for example, in family groups, use the woodland as much as possible. But that's very medieval, isn't it? it? Yeah, it is. Pigs were kept in small numbers by individuals and there was a sort of almost a ritual as you ran into the winter 
where the family pig would be killed and the, the whole rota of using every little bit of the animal um, started. Having killed one of their pigs, someone in the medieval family would have had the job of butchering it and curing it, just as Jan does. Ah, here we have half a pig. Excellent. What's that off? That's a British lot Gloucester Old Spot cross. So we count three ribs in, pop the knife in, feel the way through alongside the bones. Mind yourself there. Just bring it over. Now, of course, there'll be lots of butchers watching this who will be incredibly critical. I'm not a butcher. I'm a I poet. You don't a poet. <laughs> <laughs> and we just take that out to leave the leg. So there you have a loin of pork. Mm -hmm. This is a mixture of the salt and saltpetre and the various ingredients that you need to dry out the, the loin. This process takes a minimum of a week. Most medieval families wouldn't be able to afford to eat a whole pig in one go, naturally. They would have had to make it last, perhaps for several months. And so, to preserve the meat, they cured it. Cured pork is, of course, bacon. Now, I've left the rind on, because traditionally, obviously, rind should stay on the bacon, mm. and it, it's one of the, the, the delights of it. Now, I can feel the moisture already beginning to leach out because of the salt. So, normally, that would have been done actually in a container, and then it will go into the tub and you turn it every day for a week. So, do you have one you cured earlier? I have. We'll nip over to the kitchen in a minute and uh, I've got it all sliced up and ready for us to get the yes. sizzle going. The smell of breakfast. In a lovely hot griddle pan, almost needs no time at all. But there's an important fact to remember in all of this. Apart from Collop Monday, most medieval families probably couldn't afford to have bacon for breakfast. Shall we give it a go? Absolutely. Their pigs were, after all, their main source of meat of any mm. kind. And like the piece we cured, this is just the short back. Help yourself. Mmm. It's lovely. We think of bacon as breakfast now, mm. but historically it was the staple food mm. of almost everybody. And it would have tasted something like this. But also, the whole pig is curable. You literally bone the whole pig out from top to tail and bury it in salt. There are records of people doing it in old Roman sarcophagi, especially in the Savernac Forest. I can't, kind of couldn't think of a better way to go, really. No, quite. <laughs> Bacon, in fact, only became associated with breakfast in the 17th century, an age of relative prosperity when people were no longer so tied to the land. Which leads me to wonder what, if anything, do we know about our earliest breakfast customs? This is University College London, my old alma mater, and I've come to meet Dr Ian Mortimer, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, to find out what constituted a medieval morning meal and who ate what. Dr Mortimer, breakfast. Did everybody eat the same sort of breakfast or was it very divisive by structure and class? Uh, it is hugely divided from the top of society down to the bottom. Medieval society is hugely hierarchical. Uh, uh, an aristocrat would pay seven shillings for a fish at a time when um, a working man would earn fourpence in a day. At the top end of society, it can be a matter of choice whether you have breakfast. At the bottom end of society, people still starve to death. So for them, it's not a question of whether they have any breakfast, it's whether they have any food at all. What's the earliest reference you found to breakfast? I have come across one reference which is possibly 12th century to choristers at St Paul's being given uh, breakfasts if they've been up uh, singing at night. And that's quite specific in bread and ale. What's the first aristocratic reference? Uh, as far as I can see, it's 1297, uh, when the uh, Countess uh, Joan de Valence 
um, is recorded to have had breakfast. And it's not just a, 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 a little breakfast for her, it's for her whole household, which may well have been as many as 100 people. She also had 20 poor people along. So this was a big uh, uh, breakfast um, and clearly a certain degree of ceremony, much more like a, a formal dinner. So it seems that if you were part of an aristocratic household, breakfast came with the job. And the more extravagant the lord or lady was, the better the breakfast. By far the best uh, account of what aristocrats might eat for breakfast, and everybody else in their household who is of a certain rank, uh, comes from the, the, the Earl of Northumberland's account, which is uh, 1512. And to give you an idea of what the Earl of Northumberland and his lady might sit down to, first a loaf of bread in two trenches, then two manchets, which is very high quality uh, white bread, a quart of beer, so a couple of pints to begin with, a quart of wine, because of their status, of course, half a chine of mutton, or else a chine of beef. And I mean, beef has always been the, 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 the favourite food of the English aristocracy. In fact, I notice Edward IV also having beef for his breakfasts. So... If you could afford it, then you could eat pretty well. Mm. Breakfast in a 16th century aristocratic household then was likely to be a substantial meal. And that trend continued after the Reformation, which did away with the Catholic Church's restrictions on eating food like eggs, milk and cheese. Before long, recipes for dishes like scrambled eggs began to appear, and even boiled eggs were a novelty. I've come to Gainsborough Old Hall in Lincolnshire to meet historic food specialist Caroline Yedham, and she's going to begin by demonstrating for me the old medieval way of cooking eggs, which was to roast them. Hello, I'm Clarissa. Hello. <laughs> Caroline, what are you up to? Well, we're starting with some roasted eggs, it's which good. I've got sitting in the ashes. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very ancient way of cooking eggs. Whenever I cook them, I always find them a bit indigestible. But it's why boiled eggs become much more popular. Mm. And how long do you cook them for? Well, that depends on how hot the ashes are. And that's a matter of trial and error, because if you make them too hot, then the eggs will explode. So there yeah. is a risk. Do we think it's done? Uh, definitely. Do we think it's digestible? You're welcome to try it. I will try it. Mmm, not bad at all. Oh, good. Not bad at all. I think I'd have preferred it fried, but... Um... <laughs> Thankfully for egg lovers, help was soon at hand in the distinguished form of Robert May, who, in 1660, published the first comprehensive English cookery book. The accomplished cook contains over a thousand recipes, including instructions on fried eggs, an early form of scrambled eggs, and 21 kinds of omelette, a recently imported French dish. Omelettes are now a breakfast favourite, but you'd be hard-pressed to go to work after May's recipe, according to the Turkish mode. It calls for expensive luxuries like lemons imported from Spain or North Africa, which were only available to the rich, cinnamon from Ceylon, and a particular type of roasted meat. Hair omelette, that's something out of the ordinary, is it? There seems to be an explosion in the 17th century of people finding different things to put in omelettes. I've got some chopped almonds here and chestnuts and pine kernels. Gosh, interested? this is going to be very dramatic. What's that? This is cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Nutmeg. And some freshly grated nutmeg. So that needs to go be mixed and popped on the fire and heated through. Mm -hmm. The principle of making an omelette might seem straightforward to us, but although the basic ingredients weren't new, the equipment to cook them was. After centuries of literally roasting in front of an open fire, cooks now had access to a new piece of kitchen technology, 
With a brazier, they could cook with charcoal, and that meant they had much more control over temperature. Well done. <laughs> Hooray! So this is the hair mixture. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put these on the edge. And slices of lemon, which of course are very mm. extravagant and fashionable. And I'll scatter some. What, marigold petals? Yes. It's very exciting. Give you a good layer. Never would have thought of doing hair this way. Gosh, that's nice. Gosh, that's really, really nice. Mm, I love all the different nuts as well as the hair. Mmm, wouldn't mind another one of those. Robert May's omelette is almost certainly too elaborate to have been an early morning dish, but it shows how enthusiastically our cooks took up those basic recipes we now think of as breakfast food. And when it came to eggs at breakfast, a physician of the time, Tobias Venner, urged restraint. Venner's medical book on the right way to a long life was the first to use the word obesity, and he recommends for breakfast just a couple of poached eggs together with some bread and butter and a good draught of claret. Wine or beer was the traditional morning drink for centuries, but our early morning drinking habits began to change with the arrival of coffee in the 1620s. Before coffee became a breakfast pick-me-up, it was a social drink served in coffee houses, which first appeared in the 1650s. But it was tea imported from China and first sold publicly in 1657 that was adopted more quickly as a domestic drink, not least because it was easier to prepare. Tea was certainly the beverage of choice in this London household when it was the home of Dr Samuel Johnson, the renowned author and lexicographer. But, surprising as it may sound, tea drinking became a serious social concern during the 18th century amongst a certain class of persons. Thank you. How lovely. As historian Jane Pettigrew explained to me. Now, we're in Dr Johnson's house, and he was a man who was, without being harsh, addicted to tea. He called himself a shameless and hardened tea drinker, and he drank it right through the day and well into the night, I think. Not everyone was quite so keen on tea, were they? No, it's interesting that as the labouring classes began to, to drink more tea, some people seemed to thoroughly disapprove. And you wonder whether it was because they really seriously thought tea was bad for people or because they disapproved of it being brought down into the lower classes. This was an aristocratic drink, a luxury drink, an expensive beverage. How dare these people drink tea? But some quite prominent people wrote very serious tracts against tea drinking. So Jonas Hanway, social commentator, um, decried the fact that chambermaids and housemaids were losing their bloom because of tea drinking. So this was quite an argument that was rattling around in the background um, at the same time as other people promoting tea as a very health-giving beverage. So by what date would it have become regular at breakfast or more normal at breakfast? I think probably by the late 1740s, 1750s, it's beginning to appear at the breakfast table and breakfast rooms are, being, are actually a separate room in the house so that uh, this was where you went in the mornings to actually have your, your breakfast tea. The arrival of the breakfast room, the breakfast table and breakfast tea completed the picture of the morning meal as we might recognise it today, although with rather more niceties than we have now. So, tea and breakfast. Yes, here we are at the beginning of the 19th century and tea has taken its place at breakfast as the recognised drink. And the soft-boiled eggs are particularly relevant because the first reference in anywhere in literature to a soft-boiled egg is in Jane Austen's Emma. Wonderful. Mr Woodhouse 
is proposing to Mrs Bates that she should have a soft-boiled egg. Searle understands the boiling of an egg better than anyone. I would not recommend an egg boiled by anyone but right. Searle. So how do we know these are the sort of things that um, Jane Austen and her contemporaries would have been eating at breakfast? Literary references. I mean, <laughs> wonderful source, wonderful source. The boiled eggs in, in, in Emma, the uh, brioche in, I think it's in Northanger Abbey, where she said, I wish you would not talk so much about the French bread that is served oh, right. at Northanger. And that, of course, would be the, the French brioche, bread. Yeah. yeah. And literary references seem to infer that it was a stretched meal. Mm. Just suited your, your lifestyle, I suppose. But then also, of course, breakfast parties became very fashionable and started at 10 and ran through till 3, 4, maybe 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So not, not breakfast at all, all no. but a party, a major all-day party. Ah, how funny, over breakfast. Now that's something that could catch on again. Yes. <laughs> but the offerings of a Jane Austen breakfast party are mere morsels compared with that most lavish expression of our morning meal, the English country house breakfast. Country houses were important fixtures in the aristocratic social circuit and parties based around shooting or hunting might last for days or even weeks at a time. Chatsworth House in Derbyshire is a monument to the most refined kind of country living, and it's a place where, in the 19th century, the English breakfast reached new heights of extravagance. Christine Robinson is the current head housekeeper. She has worked here for more than 30 years, but her knowledge of the history of the house goes back much further. Here we are in the, the great dining room. Wow, look at this. It is an amazing room, isn't it? Incredible. So the table's set here for dinner, but of course this is where the guests would have come down uh, and had their breakfast. And there would have been a, a buffet on the side, as there is here, which would have been laden with cold meats, game pie, probably pheasant, because they, they would have been shooting, after all, over the weekend. Lot of pheasant. Lot of pheasant, and yes. devilled pheasant legs. Delicious for breakfast. The main dining table would have had freshly prepared food, different ways of cooked eggs, fish. There would have been lots of different sorts of breads and also, of course, tea, coffee and also hot chocolate. Why did people come here in particular? Because this was a winter house, wasn't it? It was a winter house. It, the family were staying in their other houses at different times of the year. They came to Chatsworth from October through probably until February. And so it would have been an opportunity, really, to gather their friends and acquaintances together to go shooting, to show what Chatsworth had to offer. And part of that was the lavishness of the breakfast table. And you've got a family association with Chatsworth? Yes, I have. My grandmother was the youngest of 11 children born at Beeley, which is about three miles away, and her, her mother, my great-grandmother, used to come and help out in the kitchens when they were really busy at this kind of fabulous house party that we're talking about. We had a cook when I was growing up who had trained at Chatsworth, and this was regarded as being a very good reference because the amount of experience she would have had training here... And, and she was a very good cook. <laughs> I owe it all to her. Right? <laughs> but despite all the sumptuousness on offer, if you were a lady, you might prefer to start the day with breakfast in bed. Just coming now into the Wellington bedroom, which was named in honour of the Duke of Wellington, who was one of the many guests that came to stay. Fabulous room, isn't it? Fantastic. I mean, the wallpaper is just stunning. The, it is. Hand-painted Chinese wallpaper. And then wonderful bed here where the lady's maid would have brought her mistress tea and toast in bed. And of course, breakfast is the one meal of the day a lady can still eat in bed without being thought of as slovenly. What's through there? We've got the dressing room through here. and This is where the, uh, the gentleman would have slept if he'd had a late night at cards. Rather than come in and disturb his wife, he would have slept in the, the smaller bed uh, in here. Is late at cards or perhaps sleeping in somebody else's room? Oh, well, <laughs> I wouldn't like to say. There were a lot of but corridor sure creaking, yes. creeping, I think.
If the Chatsworth corridors did creak, they must have been at their noisiest in the days when the notorious Marlborough House set and the future King Edward VII were frequent guests. <laughs> Hannah Obi is the curator at Chatsworth and she's been making a study of the social life of the house. All sorts. Yes. Earl Spencer. Yep, exactly. Chatsworth, of course, was famous for country house parties mm. with country house breakfasts as part and parcel of the celebrations. But um, tell me a bit more about the parties. The parties, I think, really took off in the um, eighth Duke's time. But towards the end of his life, because he had this 30-year love affair with Louise, who was Duchess of Manchester, and after she, her husband, died, they got married. And she brings all these amazing people up from London and have these incredible house parties. So it really is the high point of Edwardian high-octane glamour. <laughs> <laughs> I like the high-octane glamour. What have we got here? So what we've actually got here is uh, an illustration from 1901 when there was a house party for Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. But also present was his mistress, Mrs Keppel. You've got the 8th Duke of Devonshire and you've also got his uh, new wife, Louise, or Lottie as she was known. So she and Mrs Keppel are flanking Edward VII. One of Edward VII's favourite breakfasts, and I don't know if he had it here, was you hollowed out an onion, you, you boiled an onion mm. and hollowed it out and then filled it with a dish of chicken livers cooked in cream and brandy. Put it back in the onion, put the lid on, just gave it a little longer in the oven, yeah. and then he would have that for breakfast. I just, I, I just can't imagine having that for breakfast. But then, when you think about how many pheasants he was going out to shoot when he left at about ten o'clock in the morning, that might actually make a bit of sense. We've got a wonderful photograph of him just on the back of a pony, sort of going over the moors, looking very. Very heavy going, I think it was. Yeah, so maybe that's why he needed a good breakfast in the country, but I'm not sure so much in London what his excuse would have been. <laughs> <laughs> I think gluttony. <laughs> All the same, Edward VII's hugely indulgent breakfast was very much in keeping with the spirit of the age. A recommended menu for a large party would typically have more than two dozen hot and cold dishes, including such delights as eggs in aspic, cookie of shrimp, hashed venison, and broiled pigeons. I've chosen a very particular Victorian breakfast speciality, and I'm going to ask Chatsworth's current head chef, Dan Brazil, to cook it for me. Hello. You must be Daniel. Hello. Hello. I've got a chore for you. OK. I have here a rather strange book by an anonymous Victorian gentleman right. called Major L, and he gives breakfasts for large parties for the month of August. Kidneys, lobster, and a sole Colbert. Ah, sole a la Colbert. In Francatelli, chef to Queen Victoria, he gives a recipe for sole a la Colbert, which um, is so fried, and then you take the bone out, stuff it with maitre d'hotel butter, pour over some maitre d'hotel sauce. Seems like a lot of butter uh, for breakfast, so. Well, over to you. Do you not have a cooked breakfast? I very rarely have time for a cooked breakfast these days. Um, I don't think many people do. Uh, maybe a, a treat on a weekend, um, on a Sunday, or perhaps the birthday if my wife's feeling generous. <laughs> so I've got some seasoned flour here. So you've rubbed it over with flour and you're painting it with the beaten egg. We're using lemon sole today. I'd imagine that uh, Queen Victoria would have had Dover sole. And then you're going to dip it in some breadcrumbs, fry it in very hot lard or frying fat to swim it. So swimming in fat. And he says cook it until it's well done. I mean, I wouldn't cook a fish until it was well done. When done, cleverly, cleverly, we're relying on you to be cleverly, remove the backbone without deforming the fish. Coming. Look there at that. Hmm. I'm most impressed. 
Finally, we're told to fill the fish with two ounces of Metz d'Hotel butter. That's butter with chopped parsley and onion. And then serve it with Metz d'Hotel sauce, a white sauce made with another two ounces of butter. Sole a la cold there. Amazing. Extraordinary to think they ate that for breakfast. You'd have a heart attack by lunchtime. Mmm. Very nice, but not, I think, for breakfast. Yes, I think as a dinner dish it's very nice, but uh, for breakfast, not for me. Nor me neither. And in case you're wondering, a dish of Sola Le Colbert comes in at a little over 1,800 calories. The perfect start for a day on the moors? Well done. In the meantime, throughout the 19th century, our cities were growing and a new middle class was emerging. They may not have had country estates, but they did want a few luxuries to go with their bacon and eggs, and so they went shopping. And there was one establishment that prided itself on knowing exactly what the right sort of person should have on their breakfast table. Fortnum and Mason was founded by a former royal footman in 1707, but by the 19th century, it was providing the newly rich with access to goods that had once been the preserve of the gentry, as the store's archivist Andrea Tanner explained to me. It's lovely to be here uh, again. I spent a lot of my childhood coming around Fortnum's well, with my back. mother. Thank you very much. <laughs> when I was a child, Fortnum's was a great place if you needed it for pointing you in the right direction. Yes, I think the shop has always had an educative role. Um, when the shop began, um, its customers were only the aristocracy and the landed gentry. But, you know, the British Empire grew, people became more prosperous. And those who had a bit of money and now had a bit of leisure wanted to have what the aristocracy had. They wanted to know the right thing to eat, the right thing to wear, the right thing to say. So the sort of thing that Fortnum's would do would be, you know, if someone wants to know what does the Duke of Grafton, what sort of tea does he have? Gently, you would be directed towards a suitable sort of tea, a suitable blend of coffee, um, particular made-up dishes for, for breakfast because we had an enormous department where if you weren't up to making your veal patties and croquettes and so on, we would make them for you and get them to you in plenty of time for breakfast. But even when I was young, and when you came to Fortnum's, it wasn't like this. You didn't handle things. No, you weren't allowed to touch anything. Heaven forfend. You were met at the door by a gentleman in a frock coat who would bow to you, and he had a little notebook, would determine your name if you, he didn't know who you were, and determine what you would like to buy, and then he would lead you around and make suggestions to you, but you weren't allowed to actually touch anything. You were allowed to taste things, but no, no. And then, of course, no money passed hands at Fortnum's in those days. Everything mm. was on account, so you got to enjoy the goods a good month or two before you actually paid for them. <laughs> Another thing you would definitely want for your breakfast table was marmalade, a delicacy which was probably first brought to this country in the 1660s by one of my great heroines, the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, when she married Charles II. Wonderful sight. This is our oldest marmalade, which is Burlington breakfast marmalade. You can see the peel in there. And this was made... Um, for the first Earl of Burlington and made um, to a recipe that actually was his chef's recipe. So we were given the recipe in the 1730s. Have you always sort of made marmalade and no, sold it? No, we haven't. It wouldn't have occurred to us um, to make marmalade because our customers had staff who oh. made homemade marmalade. Um, but we would have sold them the sugar and also the citrus fruits to make it. Ah, brilliant, I love that. 
But it was really the First World War and the demands of uh, the Western Front. That's when we started making our own marmalade. But we didn't put them in jars, we put them in tins because it was much safer to send it out to you the officers. used to send to my father. There I have are. letters, or had letters, you know, oh. say things like, oh, I need some more marmalade, or that fruitcake was particularly good, you know, that Fortnum's one, can, can you send me another one? Excellent. Well, he was in good company because Clemmy used to send Winston Churchill marmalade from Excellent. Fortnum's during the First World War. Throughout the Victorian and Edwardian eras, the country house breakfast was the model of early morning refinement, and the Victorians, in particular, kept on inventing and adapting new dishes. Andrea and I are going to sample two of the best known. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course, everybody thinks that kippers are really old, that it's an old method of curing fish. Yes, it almost looks medieval, but it's a 19th century English invention, yes. 1861 in Craster. Today we smoked herring in the way in which the Scots smoke salmon. Oh, really? Yep. Right. So it's, what, 150 years old, mm. that's it. But very delicious. Very delicious, and of course now very much associated with breakfast. Indeed, indeed. Much older on the table would be what I'm having, which is kedgeri. Yes, it's a very ancient dish. It was originally the preferred breakfast of the poor in India, made up of just rice and lentils. It was taken up by the Mughal emperors during their fasting period when they had it for breakfast too, and they were the people who first added fish to it. But, of course, it was those intrepid officers who set off to build the British Empire who brought the recipe for kedgeri back to their breakfast tables at home. So you've got this coming back from India as early as the 18th century. Yes. But, of course, you've got smoked haddock in your mm -hmm. kedgeri, and that is a Victorian introduction. The fish in India was never smoked, it was always fresh. But by the time kedgeri became part of the great British country house breakfast, smoked haddock became absolutely de rigueur. You mm -hmm. could not use another, another form of fish or it wasn't a proper kedgeri. Really? And the lentils had long since oh, gone? Oh, they had long since gone. I think the lentils disappeared on the boat coming from <laughs> India to Tilbury. So it was a combination of staple foods, aristocratic customs and imported influences that gave rise to the rich and varied traditions of our morning meal. But then, just as the culinary crescendo of the English breakfast reached its climax at the end of the 19th century, from over in America came the first rumblings of a revolution that would make the country house breakfast history. The man in the hat is Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. His name is synonymous with the best-known breakfast cereal in the world, although it was not the first. Today, cornflakes of all brands are a breakfast staple, but they were conceived as part of a much grander scheme to convert us all to vegetarianism. Dr. Kellogg pursued this aim with evangelical fervor because he was a member of an energetic new Christian church, the Seventh-day Adventists, who interpreted passages from the book of Genesis as an instruction from God that mankind should not eat meat. Like many of history's most important moments, the invention of the cornflake in 1894 was an accident. And it's one I'm going to see recreated here in Leeds at the university's School of Food Science and Nutrition. Dr Kellogg and his brother Will had been working with wheat rather than corn, and these three young students, Callum, Zach and Charlotte, are going to repeat the experiment for me. So, Callum, what have we got here? This is the uh, raw wheat grain, which John Harvey Kellogg actually made his first flake from. Everybody knows he was famous for using corn, but his first experiments were with wheat. Which and in, is 
quite hard. It is, it is very hard, and in its raw form, uh, you can't really do much with it with regards to eating. And um, so this is it soaking, is it? Yes, it is. The grain will take up some water and it will hydrolyze some of the starch and soften it a little bit. And this is typically kept at approximately 5 to 15 degrees overnight. After soaking the wheat grain, the Kellogg brothers boiled it for one hour. And then they dried it again, which is where Zach takes over. And how does this dry them? Hot air just passes over the top of them and that just helps remove some of the excess moisture that you've got built up on the surface. So it's a giant hairdryer, really? It is a giant hairdryer. Initially, one of the problems faced by the Kellogg's brothers when they were um, producing the first wheat flakes was that if there was too much moisture, when they put them through the roller, it just smushed into a sludge. horrible mass and a bit of a sludge. And if they're too dry after this, if we dry them too much, then when you roll them through, they'll just crack like hard bits of rice. Oh, really? So we'll just pop the uh, dryer on now. The Kellogg brothers didn't have a hair dryer naturally, and they struggled to get their grain to the right consistency. Until that is, they accidentally left a batch standing for several hours. Great. By the time the brothers noticed their mistake, the grains were mouldy, but they were also the perfect consistency for rolling into flakes, as these are now. Now we've laid them all out on the sheet, it's just time to cover them over and then pass them through the roller. And that's my job? Goes round and Just through. like an old fashioned mango. Yeah. Look at that. A couple of them have merged into each other. Uh, it doesn't look a lot you... like corn flakes. So, Charlotte, you've got the flakes here, beautifully rolled by me. Yes, very um, well done. What, um, what are you going to do now? Lay it on a baking tray, and that's what I'm going to be doing right now. It takes a lot of patience, actually. Extraordinary. You'd think by this stage they'd have given up, really. <laughs> and how long do you bake them for? About 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, the first batch of wheat the Kellogg brothers rolled was mouldy, but they soon developed their own drying technique to produce edible flakes. All right, looks like we've got a full tray ready to be popped into the oven. All right, so these are nice and warm right out of the oven. If you would like to give a taste. It doesn't taste all that wonderful. It doesn't really look something like you want to have for breakfast, does it? And so, with, after a range of experiments, we found out that if we mashed up the wheat grains mm -hmm. and we chop it up to break up the husk a bit more, and we roll it up, follow the same procedure as before, mm -hmm. and with that, we end up with the end result of this. That's much better, isn't it? Yes, it Visually. is. And actually, it tastes considerably yeah. better. How extraordinary. Well done. Thank you. That's fascinating. So that's how they were invented. But it doesn't explain why Dr. Kellogg's cornflakes became so popular. This is the, the ten gates of digestion. I've come to meet another doctor. Yes, without saying constipation once, which is a real Dr. Cowrie O'Connor is a historian from University College London. So, she grew up eating Kellogg's cereals and she has a very full knowledge of the man behind them. John Harvey Kellogg, Victorian obsessive. Cornflakes was where he kicked off, was it? No, he started back with grains of all kinds because the, um, the Seventh-day Adventist belief was uh, God's own food, was grain, vegetables, 
not. So Nuts he, being the obvious word. <laughs> yes, indeed so. He invented peanut butter while he was at it. He was a very, very uh, innovative and inventive man. But mainly, he was trying to save America through a change of diet. So he wanted to invent all sorts of grain-based foods. And he was, he was particularly challenged by breakfast because it was um, the beginning of the day and the beginning of the digestive cycle. And he wrote a wonderful book called The Itinerary of a Breakfast, where he charts breakfast as it goes through the ten gates of the body and exits. And he thought that nature should provide the perfect laxative in the way of grain. So from the beginning, he was always trying to develop good grain-based ways to start the day. Well, the Victorians were completely obsessed with their bowels and constipation and regularity. It was a thing of the age. Well, absolutely, and, and he prime among them. He also began to think that oatmeal porridge, cooked porridge, which was the great Victorian standby, was no good because it gets stuck on its way through the ten gates of the body. So what was really needed was something that was quick, easy and cold. <laughs> The testing ground for the cornflakes recipe that Dr. Kellogg and his brother devised was the sanitarium, a health spa in Michigan that the doctor managed. It was the guests here who were the first to try the original cornflake in 1895. So this is the foundation of the Kellogg's Empire, these golden flakes of corn, very, very light. Now, when they first um, did the corn flakes, they were slightly tasteless. So one day, when uh, the doctor was on a trip, the brother decided to improve on the recipe by adding malt and sugar to the uh, flavoring. This is the cornflake we have now, transformed it, instant success, but the doctor never ever wanted to sell any of these cereals. He just wanted to let them be for the people in the sanitarium and do them by mail order. And the brother said, my God, we could make a fortune. Why don't we sell them to the world? And um, they fell out. <laughs> The decision to sell cornflakes as a product drove a wedge between the two Kellogg brothers. It was the younger one, Will Keith, who founded the cereal company in 1906 and became a multi-millionaire. The principle of adding sugar to cereals to stop them tasting like horse food, as Will K once said, created a breakfast bandwagon. The doctor's idea of an unadulterated grain-based meal was transformed into a whole range of products, some of which the Kellogg Company found could be marketed very effectively to children. And this is their master stroke. Frosties. Frosties. Yes, with Tony the Tiger, Tiger, one of the most iconic characters ever created for anything, the king of the breakfast table. Great. Great. Right, that's it. Compare this, which is a sugar-covered cornflake, to the standard cornflake. Well, this is twice as heavy. Yeah. It must be the sugar, but there we are. And the child is going to want to rush for the sugar. Absolutely. Sugar-frosted flakes, as they were known in America, were launched in 1952, but the sweetening of cereals didn't stop there. Six years later, an even more tempting, child-friendly product appeared. Cocoa Pops. So you not only have something that's sugared, but you have it with cocoa. And then you put on milk, and it turns into chocolate milk. I mean, who can resist that? Um... And, and think of what the doctor is saying by this time, spinning in his grave like a turbine, I should think. I don't know that I agree with the doctor's prognosis that everyone would benefit from a grain-based laxative. All the same, even though there's less sugar in many Kellogg cereals now than there used to be, I have to say a sweetened cereal for breakfast isn't for me. I've come finally 
to a place where almost every conceivable kind of morning meal is on offer, the hotel breakfast room. I'm meeting writer Tom Parker Bowles, a food lover after my own heart. How are you, Greta? Ah, Tom, how are you? Lovely to see you. Right, breakfast. Absolutely. Yes, I wonder who you're There, there. You have that one. I've asked Tom to join me to reflect on what has happened to our idea of an English breakfast. Duck eggs with soldiers. Thank you very much. Bacon and eggs, sir. Thank you very much. Welcome, sir. Say, so very traditional, Tom, bacon and eggs. I think bacon and eggs is one of the great breakfast combinations of all time. Pig and egg. Sublime. And it's the, you know, bacon is a great British art, isn't it? Mm. Um, what was that lovely thing? The hen is involved, but the pig is totally committed. <laughs> well, this is a proper breakfast. It provides you with... I mean, uh, admittedly, I'm not often allowed to go and work the fields or go down the mine or anything particularly physical. But this, to start a day with a breakfast like this, puts you in a good mood. Whenever I go away and stay at a hotel, I always have the full English because it's, it's something quite wonderful and glorious. And do you think when people go to hotels, even people who don't normally eat breakfast, that um, they'll have breakfast? Yes, it is. It's, it's luxury to have breakfast now, I think, to have a cooked breakfast. If you're obsessed with fats and meat and all that sort of stuff, well, you're not going to get any pleasure out of anything, are you? But, yeah, my wife never eats a cooked breakfast, but if we go somewhere, she'll always have it. I saw the most extraordinary thing the other day. There was a Frenchman sitting in the hotel where I was, and he had a plate of bacon mm. and a couple of boiled eggs turns up, and he breaks open the boiled eggs and scoops them on top of the bacon and eats them. And I said, why are you doing that? And he said, oh, this is what I like. I tell you what, that's a very rare thing to see a Frenchman who understands a good English breakfast. Because mm. you go to the continent, and not to put, you know, many great things about the continent, breakfast ain't one of them. I mean, we could not have built an empire on croissants and rubbish pastries. <laughs> you know, this is empire building ballast and stuff. The Battle of Waterloo was won over a plate of bacon and eggs. It probably was. It was. Can you, can you imagine? You know, going to war on a croissant. That's why they always lost, I think, mm. to be honest. You know, it's, a, it's the, you know, good old pig and egg. I mean, pig is the key to. A good breakfast, yeah. isn't it? What do you think influences people's choice of breakfasts? Sadly, these days, time. I mean, everybody is in a rush in the morning for various reasons. They're rushing to work, they're rushing to the children's school, they're rushing to, rushing to everything. It's just quick rush, rush, rush. When I give the children boiled eggs, you know, I'm rather rushing them through, whereas mm. you wouldn't do that at dinner. So therefore, going back to the big full English breakfast, it is a treat, because you need time to cook it, to eat it, dare I say, to digest it as well. Mm. We spend three hours over dinner. Why not spend a bit of time over breakfast? Breakfast cereals have been around for more than 100 years, but I prefer our older cook traditions, although maybe not so la la Colbert. Like all good food, a good breakfast comes at a cost. And, as much as anything, the real cost these days is time, which is perhaps why we mostly restrict our morning indulgences to when someone else is doing the cooking. Next week, I'll be looking at lunch, a meal that 300 years ago didn't even exist, but which has been adapting to the changes in our working lives ever since. And the food, glorious food season continues here on BBC Four with Michelle Rue's profile of Escoffier in the first MasterChef at nine on Monday. And that's followed by the chef who conquered New York. Meet Paul Librant on Monday at ten. Next, though, brand new comedy coming up with Getting On.